Well, good morning and happy Thanksgiving. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 28. This morning is the end of an era. You're going to look back and say, remember when we went through the book of Acts, a year and a half through the book of Acts, and this morning is our final sermon. It's good for us to consider heroes of the faith, and in the book of Acts, Paul is one of those, right? Heroes of the faith. In fact, outside of Jesus, I think Paul is, is the most influential person in all of human history. And to think that he was a man just like you and me. He was a wayward sinner who could not have been further from the gospel, but radically changed, filled by the Spirit, and then, and then lived out the rest of his days for the kingdom of God. It's good for us to, uh, to see his sacrifices, the way that he lived his life, and to have an example, heroes of faith. There's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. If you do not have one, you can take that as a gift from us to you, and you can make that your own. So hold your spot in Acts 28, but let's pray as we jump in. Our Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony the good news of your son and, and those who have gone before us that have, have boldly proclaimed and given testimony to the salvation that is in Jesus' name that, that started on the other side of the world with, with a bunch of fishermen and peasants that you have used them to proclaim the good news across the world And here in Bernie, Texas, that we can read that your spirit has preserved it for us. And so this morning, Father, we pray that you would open our ears and our hearts to hear testimony of a life well lived. That that as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, that, that we this morning can be greatly encouraged and strengthened with the ability to persevere through your spirit, and that our lives can count for all of eternity with eternal weight and eternal glory when lived for your kingdom. Your son has taught us to pray this way, that hallowed be your name, that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done. We pray to that end this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Paul has endured a lot since the three years that Jesus proclaimed that he would see Rome. As he nears that promised destination, Luke hints to us that Paul is nervous, that he is distressed about his fate once he gets to Rome. You know, Jesus promised that he would get there, but after that, Paul doesn't know anything. He is 43 miles outside of the capital, And he passes by a market along the Roman road. There, Paul is met by an entourage of Christians who had heard that he was coming and hurried to welcome him and then to escort him on a small portion of the journey. You see, it's an incredible kindness of the body of Christ that was needed at just the right time. And verse 15 of chapter 28 tells us that upon seeing them, Paul thanked God and he took courage. Right when his soul began to swell up with fear, God lifted his head with the encouragement of fellow believers. Verse 16 and 17, Luke writes, when we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself and with a soldier who was guarding him. And after three days, Paul called together those who were the leading men of the Jews. Rome was the greatest city that Paul had ever seen. 
For decades, he had dreamt of what it would be like in the bustling streets and with the traffic all around. Nearly a million people, that is slaves and and free men and Roman citizens and immigrants. The city on seven hills was the peak of civilization with luxurious villas and Impressive public buildings. It was the center for, uh, for entertainment with chariot races and gladiator combat. But like large cities in those days, there also came with it a stench. And it was rampant with disease. Paul, of course, is going to see Rome through the lens of kingdom advancement. How the gospel would now reach the ends of the world through the epicenter of Rome. Every class and group of people could now take the good news of Jesus Christ back to their own people. Wanting to be centrally located, Paul rented a decent-sized home in the northern part of the city, near the Praetorian Guard, where he would spend the next two years under house arrest, with a soldier loosely chained to him at all times. He was not permitted to leave, but he welcomed visitors. He had his assistants run errands for him. This home would now become central command as Paul would send word out through his assistants to churches who are thousands of miles away. Not surprisingly, only three days in, Paul calls to him the Jewish leaders of Rome, inviting them to his house. There are more than 60,000 Jews living in and around Rome, and so these leaders are going to have tremendous influence. They could influence hundreds, if not thousands, of other Jews. Now, 10 years earlier, Emperor Claudius had swiftly punished the Jews in Rome for continually making disturbances. All right, that's probably why here in Acts 28, uh, we find the Jewish leaders much more peaceable, and they seem to have had very little political clout with the Romans. And they agree to meet with Paul there in his home. And Paul, of course, surprise, surprise, he was bold and passionate about preaching the gospel. Verse 23, when they had set a day for Paul, they came to him at his lodging in large numbers. And he was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning until evening. Explaining, testifying, trying to persuade You see, Paul is a masterful teacher, and he opens the Hebrew scripture, and he will show them example after example about how Jesus was the suffering promised Messiah. And then Paul Paul follows that up with his own testimony about how he met him on the Damascus road about how Jesus has strengthened him and encouraged him all along the way. With each word, Paul's personal relationship with the Son of God, it is either compelling or odious to his audience. Verse 24 and 25 tells us that some were persuaded and believed, while others argued and left. To those rejecting Paul gives them a final parting word. And he quotes for them Isaiah 6, 9 through 10. You keep on hearing, but you do not understand. You keep on seeing, but you will not receive. Just like Isaiah would preach to a people that would not listen because they had hardened their hearts So now Paul leaves them with those same piercing words. For the heart of this people has become dull. And in verse 28, therefore, 
Let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, for they will listen. And with that final scene of Luke's account, Luke's account has reached its climactic end. With Paul, now stationed in Rome, the gospel will reach the ends of the empire. The thesis that was set out in Acts 1.8 has been completed, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit of God comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Luke's account will end on this dramatic note. Paul, freely preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ stationed in Rome. And it it causes you to, to dream and to imagine, to understand that 2,000 years later, this ripple effect has reached Bernie, Texas. But what happened to Paul, you ask? I will do my best with our time remaining to piece together from the other epistles and from church history the account of the rest of Paul's life. Over the next two years, Paul is under house arrest. Paul's presence in Rome will wield heavy influence throughout the entire empire. Those that visit his house, they they leave encouraged and changed. The guards who rotated in a shift of watching him, they got to know him one by one. They heard him pray privately. They heard conversations with the guests that would come to visit. And they even heard him dictate the letters that we know as Colossians and Ephesians. Can you imagine the richness of those days being chained to Paul? The day that he wrote, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. When Paul wrote that, he was concerned about the heresy that was spreading through the church in Colossae. And the Spirit of God allowed him to utter such magnificence. Let's say Luke is writing. And when Paul finishes writing that, he turns to the soldier sitting next to him who now has tears streaming down his face and looks at Paul and says, I want to know Jesus the way you know him. And one by one, Soldier after soldier who guards Paul is saved. And it spreads throughout the entire Praetorian Guard. Over the course of the next two years, old associates would find their way to Paul, one of which was John Mark. John Mark had deserted Paul and Barnabas in the first missionary journeys. And Barnabas wanted to give John Mark a second chance as they went out on their second journey. But Paul exploded in anger, causing Paul and Barnabas to split. And now, more than a decade later, John Mark walks into Paul's presence. Paul has lived with the years of regret over that explosion. And now he finally gets the opportunity in person to seek John Mark's forgiveness. 
And through many tears and a sweet embrace, John Mark will become a great comfort and use to Paul. A few more weeks go by. Paul is getting daily visitors from Roman Christians. Priscilla and Aquila are frequent. His associates, Demas and Ariscus, uh, give various updates of what's going on. And then one day, Luke, he comes in and he says, Paul, there is someone that you have to meet. And in walks a young, rugged, runaway slave. Battered by life on the street, he is restless with worry and paranoid by his past. Now, before I give this account, you must understand that slavery in the Roman world was complex, but it was not chattel-based slavery based on race. It was much more an indentured servanthood. Young man, what is your name? Onesimus? And Luke comes and whispers in Paul's ear. He's a runaway from Philemon. Now, Philemon was a prominent member in the church of Colossae. And although Paul had never been to Colossae, he knows Philemon personally and quite well. And with a depth of compassion, Paul looks Inissimus in the eyes and says, Son, would you share a meal with me? And one meal soon becomes ten. And each time the bitterness and the anger softened. You know, as bold as Paul was with Jewish leaders, he was equally as patient and tender with those who were coming from a place of brokenness. Maybe it was at this time, after meeting Onesimus, that Paul wrote Ephesians 4, 2, that says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bear with one another in love. And soon, Anisimus gets saved and baptized, followed by weekly discipleship with Paul. Over the course of months, he is, he is scarcely recognizable to his former self. And then it was time for Onesimus to do the right thing and to return to Philemon. He still owed a considerable debt And as a believer, he had to face his past and make things right. Onesimus would return to Colossae, but he wouldn't return empty-handed. He would return with a letter from Philemon's friend, Paul. It is the only one of Paul's letters that is personal in matter. And as you read what we call Philemon, you get to understand and see Paul's character on display. Paul will detail to Philemon that Onesimus has come to faith in Christ and he has captured Paul's heart as a son. Paul would love to use him as an associate, but only if Philemon agrees to it. Even though he ran away, God used the circumstances to save Onesimus And now he not only returns, he returns more than a slave. He returns a beloved brother. So if you consider me a partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. And then Paul reaches over and grabs the pen. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. It's a compelling snapshot of contempt for slavery and equality within the church and the power of the gospel to change lives and Paul's love for people. Finally, in AD 62, the day came for Paul to stand trial before Nero and the senators. We can assume that Paul spoke with in a straightforward manner, as Luke had recorded so many times previously. And when the votes were tallied, 
The majority was in his favor. He was a free man. In many ways, it was a win for Christianity, for Gallio had previously ruled that Christianity was not an illegal cult, and this ruling upheld that matter. As Paul left the Curia, he inhaled his first breath of freedom in more than five years. Now, the evidence that follows from here is fragmented. We basically have the three pastoral epistles. Paul will send Timothy to Ephesus and Titus to Crete. And history records for us that Paul likely went to Spain. That is the furthest known west part of the world. His travel there lasted probably two years. And then he headed back to the eastern Mediterranean to check on the other churches that he planted. In AD 64, an ominous event occurred, the Great Fire of Rome, which burned for nine days, causing immense damage and death. And Nero was rumored to have started the fire so that he could construct a new palace in that area. But instead, Nero blamed the Christians for the fire. In the famous words of Tatticus, a vast multitude were not only put to death, but put to death with insult. In a sadistic manner, Nero dressed Christians in the skins of animals and then unleashed packs of dogs to tear them apart. With others, he dipped them in tar, hung them on a pole, in his garden, lit them on fire as lights, and hosted parties while he was dressed as a jockey and rode around in his chariot. He was demonic and mad. Pockets of intense persecution would spread across the Roman Empire. Former guards who were now Christians were themselves dying in agony. The testimony of Christian martyrs would gain the attention of onlookers. Seneca once wrote, In the midst of the flame, I have seen men not groan. That is little. Not only not complain, that is little. Not only not answer back, that too is little. But I have seen them smile and smile with a good heart. Rejoicing to suffer for his name. Rejoicing because his grace is sufficient. Rejoicing because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. In stark contrast, I'm going to give you a cultural snapshot and an event that occurred just this week. I share this with you because I want to share with you the expectations of our culture. Megan uh, Megan Rapino is one of the most famous outspoken women's soccer players who is playing her final match and long to go out with with a grand final game. But instead, in the first five minutes of the game, she had an injury and snapped her Achilles with lots of pain. Now, afterwards, in the press conference that followed, Megan, with lots of explicitives and other such things, declared that she doesn't really believe in God, but this thing that happened here, this is now proof that there is no God because she got injured in her final game. In many areas of the empire, the church, because of the persecution, now had to go underground as the imperial policy gained momentum. Paul would write to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2. First of all then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and for all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. 
You see, the enemy was attacking the church on many fronts. Many were falling away from the faith. Now more than ever, faithful leaders were needed to stand for truth in the midst of this great persecution. In the summer of AD 66, Paul was checking on the churches in Northwest Asia. He had sent Titus and Timothy to check on other churches. And he was in Troas. And there he was betrayed and arrested. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. Timothy, be on guard against him yourself, for he has vigorously opposed our teaching. All who were in Asia deserted me, including Phlygelus and Harmon Guinness. And the intense persecution, Paul, will be much alone. He will walk this final path very similar to Jesus. Chained and transported to Rome. He was thrown in a dungeon, reached only by a rope ladder through a hole in the floor above. He was now considered a hardened criminal. At Paul's initial hearing, he writes, no one supported me, but all have deserted me. May it not be counted against them. It's quite a different scene than it was four years prior. Paul is being tried for the same crime, that is, being a religious leader of a cult. But Nero has now declared war against Christianity. In fact, Peter too has been captured in Rome and will be executed on the very same day as Paul. Paul knows that the time of his departure is near. He has only months before his official trial. He's in prison. Communication is very limited, but he is able through Luke's hand to get word out. One final letter to his beloved Timothy. Demas has deserted him. Cretans and Titus have gone to check on other churches. Luke alone is with me. Timothy, do your best to get to me before winter. Bring John Mark, for he is a help to me. Second Timothy is filled with personal statements of faith, along with the most important final instructions for the church and its leaders. Paul knows his time is at the end, and so he wants to send those final instructions. Here is Paul's most infamous charge with four amplifiers. That is, Timothy, preach the word of God. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. Christians will seek out teachers who will tell them what they want to hear. Popular, feel good things according to their own selfish desires and not according to the truth of God's word. If God's word does not challenge you, if it does not convict you, if it does not stretch you, if it does not expo uh, ex expose your warts, if it does not show you areas that you need improvement, if God's word is not encouraging to you, if it is not calling you forward to Jesus, then you are not submitting to it or I am not preaching it. Like seriously, if you can sit underneath my teaching or the teaching of this church for a six-month period of time 
and not have times of reproof and rebuke, encouragement and exhortation, then something is wrong. We have made God in our image instead of us being transformed into his image. But in addition to those final charges, those final exhortations to the church, Paul's final letter is rich in a dying man's personal faith. Timothy, do not be ashamed of me, his prisoner. And don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. But join me in suffering. Suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Paul has every intention of standing before Caesar and the Senate of Rome and boldly proclaiming the gospel until the very end. For this gospel, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher, and therefore I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Paul stood before Nero and he was sentenced death by beheading. The date honored in Rome of his martyrdom is June 29th, AD 67. The night before, it is believed that Paul stayed in a tiny cell outside the spot of his execution. Luke is probably outside of his window. We do not know if Timothy or John Mark reached his side. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Early the next morning, the executioner came to get him. The scene is dark. Few words are spoken. The opposite of the honor that he is due. Paul now, with stark white hair and beard, walking with a severe limp, dozens of scars mar his body, each telling a story of his journey, each one a badge of honor to his Lord. But make no mistake, Paul has a smile as he says goodbye to Luke. He is moments away from taking his final breath in this life. And in an instant, he will be in the presence of King Jesus. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown, the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Will you pray with me? Our heavenly Father and King Jesus, as we have heard the words of your servant Paul this morning, as he has given his account of faith, keeping the faith firm until the end, receiving the reward of his faith, that is to be in your presence, as he has charged us and encouraged us mightily that we can spend our lives chasing after your kingdom. Heavenly Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name all across this room that our hearts would be greatly encouraged, stirred to faith, Faith, persevering faith that longs to see our lives, our one lives spent on the glory of your name. 
Heavenly Father, you know that is my prayer. That is the longing of my heart to hear at the end of our lives, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the presence of your master. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church family, as the praise team comes to lead us in a final song, you are invited to respond. And whatever form or fashion the Holy Spirit of God has pressed upon your heart this morning, if you are here and you have never placed your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you hear an account of, of a Paul and say, I want to know Jesus the way you know Jesus, today is the day of salvation. Come. I would love to share with you how you can place your faith in our Lord and Savior. The rest of us, if you want to use these steps or the stage as an altar, we'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. I want you to stand to your feet. I want you to sing in faith. I want you to be greatly encouraged. I want you to be charged to pursue that with your one life, you get to glorify him. Would you stand?